Okay, and we're live. All right, hi everyone. Welcome back to another exciting event as part of New Masters Academy's 10 year anniversary celebration. Woohoo! Woo! My name is Peter, <laughs> and I'd like to welcome to the stage the wonderful artist and much loved New Masters Academy instructor and coach, Catherine Bobkowski, who is going to be doing a painting demo for us today. And just Thank to you. plug, Catherine. <laughs> is also available as a personalized coach in our coaching program. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, a link to the coaching program will be dropped somewhere in the chat. Uh, and if you tuned in yesterday, uh, Catherine did have an awesome Q&A session with Marion. And Catherine is happy to take questions today as well. So if you have any questions throughout the demo today, please write them in the chat here and I will read them out during the session. And also, if you click the handouts tab in the top right, one of these uh, of the chat window, uh, you can download today's reference. So thank you so much, Catherine, for being here. And without further ado, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. And thank you guys for being here and for joining and participating in all of the 10 year anniversary events. I've had so much fun watching all of them. It's just been uh, such a such a cool thing that NMA has put on. It's been really exciting. Um, anyway, yeah, as uh, Peter mentioned, you can download the reference, but it's also in the uh, lower right hand corner of the window. Um, I'm just going to jump in because I probably need as much time as I can get um, to, to get this done. Little Alla Prima Rose study today. Um, so before I do anything, though, I'll just tell you what's on my palette here. Um, I have a titanium white. Um, uh, pyrol red transparent, uh, quinacridone gold brown, uh, yellow ochre, Indian yellow, viridian green, uh, ivory black, burnt umber, and raw umber. And I also have a medium, which is just uh, uh, one part bodied oil and one part uh, lavender spike oil. Um, and uh, my surface, by the way, is uh, this. I've used this in class before, but this is a centurion. Uh, oil prime deluxe linen um but it's a uh, it's a pad not a not a panel but it's the same uh same material so that's the name right there if you're curious um and i think that's uh, that's it so i'm going to start painting uh and yeah as peter said please uh any any moment if you have questions as they come up please just ask i love getting questions um but i'll also try to talk a little bit about what i'm doing as i go so um, I'm just going to start by staining in the surface with a mixture of burnt umber, ivory black, viridian, um, and a little bit of my medium. Relatively big brush, so I can do that quickly. Just to get rid of the white of the surface. And then I will also use this... Uh, this initial stain to help me do my drawing in a second here. And if you were in my uh, charcoal master copies class, you might remember doing um, sort of a subtractive drawing technique in the initial stages of the um, of the the uh, drawing. Um, this is sort of a very similar approach, uh, staining in the entire surface with a um, tone and then uh, removing paint using a subtractive technique to create the drawing if that makes sense but i'll show you in a second so i'm just using a hog's hair brush to do this by the way just remove a little bit of the excess oil with a paper towel and i'll start removing paint to actually create the drawing. So I'm trying to just look at the overall big silhouette shape of the flower and capture that first um, before going into any details. Um, I am measuring a little bit. Uh, I was just looking at some angles there uh, to just get the the shape of that silhouette, you know, reasonably reasonably accurate. I mean, this is a pretty uh, loose way to start, so it's 
uh, quite easy to make corrections as you go. Well, not easy. None of the stuff is easy, but you know, <laughs> it's possible to um, make corrections and to uh, move things around and shift the drawing as you go uh, working this way a little bit more easily than you can if you're starting with a, a linear approach. Because here we're just looking at shapes, we're looking at masses and relationships between shapes. Uh, and if you can focus on those and start to see those appear relatively quickly, it makes it a bit easier to see uh, how the uh, how the drawing is working and if uh, if things are actually coming together reasonably accurately. So that's just that little petal kind of swirling down, uh, catching a little bit of light there. I probably won't do too much drawing of individual petals, uh, you know, uh, in an Alaprima study, but that one's a pretty important shape. So I'll capture that one. And then there's another one actually further down. I'm so putting... we have a question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Christina is asking, is there a reason you have chosen that mixture of medium as opposed to using a different one? Uh, my uh, my medium, the uh, bodied oil and lavender spike oil? Uh, I would guess so, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, Christina says yes. Oh, great, good. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I uh, well, first of all, bodied oil is uh, is really good for your your painting. It helps to um, make the, the the paint film very strong and flexible, and it's also less yellowing um, than just using like straight linseed oil, for instance. Um, so that's the reason for the the bodied oil. And uh, bodied oil uh, is um, uh, sometimes sold under different names you might see it called stand oil uh but that's kind of a misnomer because a uh, stand oil is um made in a really particular way that's actually not how it's usually uh made anymore so they call it stand oil even though it's not really stand oil because it's uh, made through a different process um but it's just any oil that has been uh, uh aged or uh thickened and it ends up being uh it ends up creating a very um, strong, flexible paint film, and it's less yellowing than using a, a non-bodied oil. So that's why I use uh, that. The thing with the bodied oil, though, I'll just I'll show it to you. Um, it's very uh, thick, if you can see that. It's kind of a, like a maple syrup consistency. And so if you're trying to use that straight, it doesn't really work. It's hard to brush it out, and it's uh, um, sticky. <laughs> So to make it a little bit more diluted and then er therefore easier to use, um, you dilute it with a, uh, a solvent. Um, I don't use any, um, uh, you know, toxic solvents like odorless petroleum mineral spirits or gum turpentine. So that's what I use the lavender spike oil for instead. So that's just a uh, another evaporating oil the same way that OMS or turpentine are evaporating oils, but it's made from uh, spike lavender instead of, uh, you know, pine trees or petroleum. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm using to dilute the bodied oil. Um, and the two together make a really great medium. It's, um, uh, it's easy to use. It smells uh, like lavender. <laughs> um, and it uh, has a little bit of stickiness from the bodied oil, so it kind of helps your paint to just like stick to the surface, and that makes it a bit easier to work over as well. Um, and it's also good for the painting, building up nice strong layers of, 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 uh, of paint film that won't uh, crack or flake or do anything weird like that. So, um, so that's why I use it. I don't like to use alkyds. Um, I don't like to use um, basically mediums that I don't know what's in them. <laughs> so um, I don't really like to use dryers very much. Um, I'm starting to get over that a little bit, but in general, I just like to have a really simple, straightforward medium. So one part bodied oil, one part lavender spike oil, super simple. So um, I hope that answers your question, but if you have any follow-up on that, that's a big topic, please feel free to um, ask. Catherine, you are an encyclopedia. 
it's my passion. <laughs> I could talk about like oil and stuff all day. <laughs> but people would be probably a little bit bored by that. So <laughs> I love questions like that. If you guys have materials questions, please uh, feel free to ask. All right, I'm going to start getting into some color, though. That's mostly my drawing, though, as you can see. I'm just removing a little bit more paint in the center there because that's where I'm going to start. Um, I need a smaller brush, though. I was using Hogs hair brushes, by the way, um, for that. Um, and I do like using a Hogs hair brush uh, for some of those initial stages of the painting because uh, they hold a lot of paint they hold more paint than a, a synthetic fiber will it's just the nature of the of the um of the natural hair uh, the way it's structured that it holds more paint so it's uh, good for those initial stages where you know you might just need to uh you know get more paint on the surface so that you can then manipulate it um, sometimes it's hard to feel like you're making any progress in the painting if you're uh, struggling to just get paint on the surface so sometimes a, a hog's hair brush uh, can help with that. Um, this was a uh, pyrrole red transparent, quinacridone gold brown, yellow ochre, Indian yellow, and some titanium white. Um, I'm gonna start in the center of the flower where we have the most um, saturation being built up. That's a little bit too yellow. So I'm gonna add some of my quinacridone gold brown just rose that up a little bit it's not super saturated in the middle there it's kind of um more of like a peachy um almost like a skin tone color um so so i'm trying not to exaggerate the intensity there too much this is another hog's hair brush by the way just added some more um, yellow ochre and titanium white. So uh, Alika is asking if you set this still life up yourself. Uh, yes, I did. Um, yes, I photographed these flowers. These were some garden roses that I managed to get my little mitts on. Um, and I took a bunch of photos of them. Um, and this is actually the, the third one I've painted. Um, uh, if if you happen to follow me on Instagram, I did post a um, a little reel yesterday of actually another. Actually, it might be the same flower, um, but a painting of this this same group of uh, garden roses. Uh, so uh, that I've been working on that painting lately, and so I I felt like oh I could demo this because <laughs> I've been working in the same uh, color palette on this other painting of the same flower or at least uh you know the same the same kind of flower so yeah i photographed this um uh myself i do recommend by the way uh that you shoot your own photo reference as much as possible uh, especially if you're uh, wanting to do kind of more fine art sort of stuff i think it's just um better it's more um uh truthful true to who you are and your interests um uh, to shoot your own reference and to set it up exactly the way you feel that it needs to be. Um, even though that takes a little bit of time and uh, a little bit of experience, um, you know, I do really recommend that you learn how to shoot a camera on manual and, uh, and take lots and lots and lots of pictures <laughs> um, and use a real camera and not just your phone so that you have a, a really good reference to work from. Um, and just do that a lot shoot two times more pictures than you think you need at least um, so that you have lots of material to work with uh, for doing this kind of thing anyway i hope that answers your question thank you for the question that's a good one i already forgot what this mixture was <laughs> but there's some uh green down in these lower leaves so i'm just trying to slowly scumble in some of that i think that was viridian um indian yellow and a little bit of raw umber um and i uh i added the uh, indian yellow because um the viridian by itself is very blue it has a very very um uh a bluish tone to it 
Uh, so if you're painting natural greens, natural foliage and stuff like that, I need a different brush. Uh, um, okay, this one, I guess. All right. <laughs> um, if you're painting like a uh, foliage, uh, natural subjects, um, you know, stuff like that, uh, most of it is more yellow, actually. Uh, uh, so you have to make um, an adjustment to that Viridian in order to bring it back into the realm of a natural green. Um, and a lot of people uh, will, uh, for convenience, um, basically use sap green or olive green or something like that, something that's already uh, a little bit more yellow. But um, those are convenience mixtures. And um, I kind of like to have a bit more like control over what kind of specific green I'm, I'm mixing. So um, I really prefer to just use a uh, Viridian um, and then uh, adjust it myself by mixing with other uh, yellows like yellow ochre um, or Indian yellow or cadmium yellow or whatever, whatever you, you know, need in the moment to um, bring it back to a more uh, naturalistic sort of green. Just thought I'd mention that. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, slowly going to start building up some of these shadows over here now that I have a few of the um, lighter uh, half tones established. So um, now that I'm kind of walking down this way, I think I'll kind of start to head up over this way into this shadow where um, you can really start to feel some of the, if you look at the photo anyway, um, you can start to see some of the um, transparency and the luminosity of the flower. Um, you can see some of the, the warmth uh, from the inside of the flower reflecting back into the, uh, into the shadow. Okay, so we have another question. Um, sorry if I mispronounce your name, but uh, Lil, Lil Peon is asking, what do you use to thin the paint when creating layers? I remember using terpenoid, which isn't great health-wise. You may have touched on this and I just didn't hear. Um, yeah, that's a good question. No, terpenoid is not great health-wise. <laughs> so um, it's, yeah, so for my uh, medium, which I, I, I did mention, and that's what I actually add into my paint, um, that's a one-to-one -one mixture of um, bodied oil like stand oil or sun thickened linseed oil or um, you know something something in that vein um, mixed uh, as I said one to one with lavender spike oil um, that's what the lavender spike oil looks like you see it's very thin the way that a uh, terpenoid or um, gamsol or whatever would be um, you know very thin so you mix it one to one with your um, bodied oil and you get a nice brushable um, medium to work with. So that's what I use uh, building in layers, but also working out with Prima like this. Um, and then to wash my brush like I'm doing right now, um, I'm just using a uh, safflower oil. Which looks like that. There you go, safflower oil. Um, uh, so I, I don't really add that into the paint. You can, uh, you can use a uh, safflower oil as a painting medium. It just dries very slowly. So it tends to, um, uh, really extend the dry time of your painting if you're using it as a medium. And I, I don't usually prefer to do that. So I just use that to, um, clean out my brush, um, between colors. Uh, and then I, uh, wipe out as much of it as I can into a, a paper towel or a rag um, so that I'm not actually adding it into the um, into the paint into my paint that I'm using uh, on the on the surface so I hope that answers your question it makes sense so it's <laughs> the medium is one-to-one -one, uh, bodied oil with lavender spike oil and then to wash my brush I use a uh, safflower oil but I, I don't put that in the paint but yes thank you for the question uh, if I can convince people to not use, um, you know, things like terpenoid or uh, Gamsol or uh, OMS or uh, whatever, then yeah, I've had a good day then if I've convinced people to not use that stuff. <laughs> 
you don't need it. It's not traditional. It's not good for you. It's not good for your painting. Don't use it. Um, that was a mixture, by the way. Uh, well, I actually can't remember what was in there, but um, mostly it was raw umber and white um, that I'm uh, mixing to get some of these uh, kind of like gray uh, or very, very muted, very um, desaturated little uh, half tones that um, you'll see kind of running along the edges of the petals um, in, in some places just as they begin to turn away from the light. Uh, it's uh, uh, tempting to make those kind of blue sometimes, especially if you're painting outdoors. Um, and by the way, I recommend that everybody go paint outdoors. Uh, that's just one of the best ways to learn, I think, uh, to learn about how light works, to learn about color, to um, really practice observing color. Uh, you really just cannot beat painting outside and painting um, natural light. Uh, that's uh, yeah, everyone should do that. <laughs> um, but if you're outdoors uh, painting something like this, you might um, um, uh, see a lot of blue in those half tones. Uh, but painting indoors or having a, something like this, a flower like this indoors, uh, there's really no blue in it. Um, it it's a, it's a, a little bit more subtle than that. And you'll notice that there's no blue on my palette. Um, and actually I haven't even put blue on my palette in kind of a while now. It's just the more that I paint flowers uh, and especially roses, the more I feel like they just don't have any blue in them. Um, so when I see those kind of uh, very muted half tones um, along the edges of the petals, um, I usually go for my raw umber there instead. And you can see that it mixes a very delicate, uh, very neutral, um, it's not neutral, but it looks sort of neutral compared to all the peach in the flower. Uh, and that ends up being a really good color for those um, for those half tones. No one asked about that, but I um, thought I'd mention it anyway. Raw umber, it's like practically my favorite color. <laughs> so useful. Uh, earth tones in general, I just think are uh, always my MVPs on my, on my palette when painting flowers. Okay, the questions keep rolling in. Okay. Uh, Makis is asking, uh, does working a la prima make your process any different from working normally? <laughs> yes, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> oh, it's a good question. I mean, um, uh, yeah, um, if, if I'm working a la prima, I mean, first of all, I, I think if you're learning to paint, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's it's great to paint a la prima. You learn a lot about your uh, materials. You learn a lot about just using the the medium, moving it around, uh, mixing, applying. You learn a lot about your brushes. You learn a lot about the surface. You learn a lot doing a la prima. Um, so for um, anyone out there who is kind of like maybe new to oil painting or um, thinking about, um, uh, you know, joining in on some oil painting classes or, or, or starting out or anything like that. Um, do a lot of a la prima, uh, you know, short efforts um, that are sort of low commitment um, and all in one sitting and then do many of them. You'll learn a ton from that. Um, that being said, <laughs> to answer your question, Marquise, it's very different from how I normally paint um, because normally um, I am very, very, very slow. Um, I mean, in general, I guess the more or less the same uh, principles apply of working generally from dark slowly up to light. Um, uh, that so that that remains the same, you know. Um, but if I'm working the way that I, I normally work, um, I'd be going much slower. Um, I would have a very different looking palette. Um, I would, uh, I'd, I would be moving much more slowly. <laughs> um, and then things like, um, uh, like the center here, you know, for example, I, I blocked in some of the kind of peach colors in the center and then I really started working around them quite quickly. 
um, that's the kind of thing where I might put in that saturated center um, maybe even more intensely and then I would let that dry completely um, before uh, slowly building up the forms on top of it. Um, uh, and I would also look much more specifically at all of those little forms um, inside of the flower, all those little petals folding over each other uh, and, and try to really um, attentively capture those as three-dimensional forms. Whereas if I'm painting more alla prima, that's just gonna end up being kind of an impressionistic sort of thing, just something to give an idea of what's in there instead of really trying to um, describe something a little bit more um, methodically. Uh, and that, that just takes, yeah, again, just more time. So, uh, so it's, it's very different. I think you should do both though. Um, whatever your sort of long-term aspirations are as far as painting goes, uh, uh, you, should, you should learn to do both. I think, um, um, as I was saying earlier, you learn a lot um, by painting Alla Prima. Um, and I think you, even if you're a very experienced painter, you uh, continue to develop just um, your, um, your sense of how to represent things quickly or how to get a, a, a quick idea of what you're seeing. That I think that process you just continue to develop uh, no matter how long you've been painting. Um, I think painting Alla Prima is a great way to learn about your subject to just familiarize yourself, especially with the colors. Um, uh, and it's good to just work in different modes sometimes. If you're always doing a very, very slow, um, methodical kind of thing, um, well, you could also just get maybe a little bit bored with that too. So it's always nice to change it up. Um, uh, it, it's just a, a different process though, for sure. You know, I hope that answers your question, Marquise, but, um, uh, that's kind of a complicated one. If you had some follow-up, feel free. I'm building up this little petal over here that's kind of uh, uh, creeping out into the light from the shadow. So I might need to change brushes so I can get a uh, more generous paint application because that was a little bit not quite what I wanted. So. Um, so I'll switch to a slightly stiffer brush. This is still a synthetic brush. It's just a slightly stiffer brush. And you can see I'm picking up more paint with it. I'm pushing the brush into the paint to really um, uh, get a decent amount of paint actually on the brush. And then I can put down a bit more, um, <clears throat> uh, more, not quite impasto, but just like a, a, a thicker paint application. A lot of this painting right now is pretty transparent, um, kind of washy. Uh, so when you put in those uh, more opaque, like thicker passages for highlights, uh, it really helps to make the object feel three-dimensional. Um, by that contrast of uh, op opaque passages and then more transparent passages. Okay. Um, I never have the right brush. <laughs> okay, while we're doing that, uh, uh -huh. Mancha is also asking, um, what was your palette again? Is it titanium white, quinacridone red, burnt umber, yellow ochre? Iridian, raw umber, and two darker ones that I didn't get. It's um, titanium white. This is transparent pyrrole, or transparent, I'm sorry, pyrrole red transparent. Jeez Louise. It's a Holbein color. Um, and it is, I know she will want to know, it's PR254. Um, and then it's quinacridone gold brown, which is a Williamsburg color. And that's a mixture that's a uh, PR206 and uh, PO48. Um, and then yellow ochre, Indian yellow, viridian, ivory black, burnt umber, raw umber. <laughs> um, so uh, 
And I uh, arrived at that palette, um, uh, I mean, basically just uh, based off of the painting of, of these particular garden roses that I've already done. So I had kind of already uh, done some uh, uh, color mixing with them and experimenting with the um, with the palette and with the combination of colors to uh, get something that would be very limited but would uh, capture the, the the specificities of this particular flower reasonably well. Um, uh, and I, I I just do that with. Um, I mean, basically just looking at the darn thing <laughs> and then just making uh, lots of different mixtures with different um, uh, colors um, to figure out actually which ones are needed. And what I find with um, with flowers more and more is that it's usually not very many colors that you need. Um, it's, it's usually a pretty limited uh, palette. Um, the same way that like you can do quite a lot uh, in a portrait painting with just four colors, right? If you're familiar, for example, with um, the Zorn palette or the Apellus palette, which is just four colors um, for for painting figurative subjects, uh, it's really kind of the same principle for, for flowers. It might not be the same four colors, and I obviously have more than four colors here, but it can be on that level of simplicity, actually, for um, for painting flowers. Uh, that they're really not that different from painting a figure or painting a portrait. Cool. And Jim was asking, uh, how does pyrrole red compare to cadmium red? Pyrrole red is a very different pigment from cadmium red because cadmium red is an inorganic pigment and pyrrole red is a synthetic organic pigment. And your synthetic organic pigments are going to tend to be more transparent and they're going to be um, a little bit more saturated and they're most importantly going to keep their saturation more in mixtures. Um, so if you take a cadmium red and uh, the pyrrol red um, and put them side by side and mix them both with a you know, similar amount of titanium white, for example, the cadmium red will tend to go a little bit like kind of chalky um, and sort of muted and the pyrrol red will stay it, it, will, it will still lose saturation, of course, because that's just what happens when you um, mix pigments together. But it will keep its saturation more um, compared to the cadmium red. Um, and that combination, the, um, the, the saturation and the um, transparency is why I will um, actually generally not use cadmium red. I don't typically have that on my palette. Um, uh, I like the way that the um, pyrrole reds um, or the other synthetic organic reds behave in mixtures better for this particular subject than I do the cadmiums. Um, I still use cadmium yellow. It's actually kind of weird for me to use Indian yellow, um, which that's another synthetic organic pigment. Um, so it's a little bit unusual for me to use Indian yellow, but I kind of felt like for this particular flower, it needs that, that yellow glow um, instead of the really opaque cadmium yellow which doesn't quite have the same kind of uh, luminosity to it um so uh, i hope that makes sense i hope that answers your question um and if you're not sure uh, like what pigments are going to end up being inorganic or um, synthetic organic uh, the name is often a clue right so your inorganic pigments those are going to be um uh, they're going to sound like names that you would hear on the periodic table of elements, <laughs> like kind of like metals and stuff, or they're going to sound like they're just dirt, right? So ochre, that's just dirt, right? That's an inorganic pigment. Um, cadmium, that sounds like uh, some scary thing, sciency. <laughs> sounds like a metal, right? So that's an inorganic pigment. The ones that have more... Um, uh, names that sound like chemical concoctions like quinacridone and pyrrol and azo and uh, phthalo, those are all um, organic, synthetic organic pigments. So that's usually a clue. And then you can often tell just by looking at it. Is it super saturated? Is it transparent? Does it have a pretty high tinting strength? That's probably a synthetic organic pigment. If it's really opaque um, and if it is a little bit less saturated and if it loses its saturation more quickly in mixtures, it's probably an inorganic pigment. Um, anyway, I hope that makes sense. Um, 
All right. I, actually, I'm going to clean off my palette just really quickly just to give myself some more mixing room because I would like to um, get a few um, highlights woo, um, starting to go here to really make those petals uh, start to feel more three-dimensional and I need some uh, some more clean mixing space to do that so um, uh, so yeah let's so uh, let's start in on that now titanium white add just a little tiny bit of um, Indian yellow you'll notice I picked up like the most minimal amount and it does actually have um it, it you can definitely see it though um so often those uh synthetic organic pigments um have also a very high tinting strength and so therefore you just have to be a little bit uh uh cautious with them if you're trying to do some subtle thing you just have to um be aware that uh you know if i picked up a big chunk of that indian yellow and put it in this titanium white it would be like a crazy yellow explosion so um so don't do that unless that's what you're looking for uh gordon would like to know catherine do you start with a thumbnail composition and value structure design before painting um in general yeah i didn't for this one <laughs> um, but yeah, usually I, I do, or I'll do, um, um, I'll, I'll definitely do um, uh, lots of thumbnails um, and uh, really try to um, take as much time as I feel like I can to work out the, the composition before really committing to anything. Um, uh, and I think about value a lot. Uh, and the way I organize my palette usually is um, based on, um, based on, value um, so that I can keep my values organized as I progress through the, the painting. Um, so yes. And Jeremiah would like to know, uh, what do you use to clean your brushes between colors? Uh, to clean my brushes between colors, I just have a brush washer here. You can see that <laughs> full of safflower oil. Um, so that's all it's just safflower oil. Um, and I use safflower oil for that purpose because uh, I, I think I mentioned it earlier, but it's a pretty slow drying oil. Um, so you can leave it in a can like that and uh, open to the air for um, a long time and not really worry about it um, basically uh, oxidizing a lot. Um, uh, and it's non-toxic. I mean, people even cook with safflower oil, I guess, right? Uh, so you don't have to worry about it being, um, you know, not good to have on your skin or whatever, or being bad to breathe. Um, uh, it's just a, a really a safe, simple, easy alternative to using something like uh, OMS or Terp uh, to clean your brush between uh, colors. So that's what I use. Or to clean your brushes. Uh, what did I say? I said something else. <laughs> All right. Let's get a clean brush and start building over that. Uh, okay. So that's just titanium white and a little tiny bit of quinacridone gold brown. And I'll add just a tiny bit of that Indian yellow again. Um, you know, even on the very lightest areas of the of the flower, um, which might look like uh, like they're almost pure white, or in some areas they even look a little bit blue. Um, it's not blue, and it's also not white. Um, it's going to have a color, and if you are um, uh, sort of uh, well ignoring the color, or if you're exaggerating the value, taking it all the way to the extreme of being straight titanium white. Um, 
it's uh, it's not really going to look very um, naturalistic. Uh, so that's something I um, I always recommend is that uh, colors like ivory, I'm sorry, ivory black and titanium white. Um, you don't ever put those on the on the uh, on your canvas on your painting without mixing them with something else because both of those colors tend to look uh, very cold and unnatural um, on their own. Um, and especially on something like a portrait or a flower, something that's uh, overall going to be warm um, and have a sort of liveliness to it, like it's a living thing. Um, you don't want all of that coldness to just go into the painting without any um, sort of, you know, um, uh, toning it down, basically. So. Uh, so I'm always going to end up adding a little bit of some kind of a color to warm up the titanium white um, before uh, painting it in for a highlight or or whatever. I'm adding viridian green and a little bit of yellow ochre uh, for this lower petal down here that I talked about earlier. Um, these outer petals, as you move farther away from the center of the flower, um, get progressively more green. And you can see on the very outside petals, if you look at the uh, photo reference, that there's a lot of green on them. Um, and uh, and you'll see a little bit of that greenishness um, in, in the petal, even in the areas that uh, are not obviously, obviously green. Like the whole flower sort of shifts from being uh, kind of peach to being a very light green. Um, so even in the uh, highlights, I'll uh, shift it a little bit to being green. And I also made it darker because if you think about where the light is coming from, the light will be hitting basically right here the most strongly. By the time we get over here, there's less light reaching this point. So this area here should not be as light as this area here. So a little bit darker, a little bit greener. I need another clean brush. <laughs> uh, do I have any more of those? Maybe not. Okay, I'll have to do something else. Oh, nope. It helps to have a lot of brushes, guys, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it really, um, uh, it can be so frustrating to have to wash like the same two or three brushes over and over and over again as you're painting. Um, and even if you're cleaning them out in the oil or in your um, solvent, um, that's not really that clean. Um, it's not really clean until you wash it with soap. Uh, so if you're trying to do, um, a, you know, work with pretty uh, saturated or pretty uh, bright colors, um, or highlights like I'm doing now, uh, it really makes a difference to just have a clean brush available to do that with. So Catherine, I hear mm -hmm. that you may have a new live class coming out in August. Uh, what's that all about? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to be teaching um, uh, master copies in oil starting August uh, 2nd. I believe. Oh, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, which is a kind of a follow up to the last live class that I did, which was uh, master copies in charcoal. Although uh, you can certainly uh, take the new class, even if you didn't do the last one, you're more than welcome to, of course. Um, but the, the last uh, class was all about um, uh, studying masterworks, master paintings in charcoal uh, with a very painterly kind of charcoal technique um, with the idea that eventually uh, that would be kind of an introduction to oil painting and you could transition from painterly charcoal drawing to oil painting. Uh, and so here it is. This is the chance now to make that connection. Um, so uh, we will be studying um, uh, different genres, uh, still life painting, landscape painting, figure and portrait painting, um, 
in oil, of course, as I, as I already said. <laughs> um, uh, and we will work first in monochrome and then talk about using uh, limited palettes, uh, introduce uh, some, some color theory, uh, and, and, and also uh, go a little bit more slowly. So it's actually a 10 week class, whereas the last one I, I think was uh, seven weeks. So a little bit more um, of a slow progression through the topic so that you can really take your time. Um, and especially if, uh, if you're not already uh, familiar with it, uh, get used to or get to know um, a new medium as well. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, uh, it's a, a, a class that I always really enjoy teaching. I think it's a really good one um, for you know, introducing uh, painting topics, uh, a, a, a great way to begin doing that is through um, basically just looking at really great paintings and trying to uh, learn directly from those as much as possible. Um, and of course, I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through all the other uh, uh, questions <laughs> that might come up along the way. Um, I'm going to make it a, you know, friendly for new painters. So if you really don't have very much experience at all, um, you don't feel intimidated or like you can't do it, you're absolutely more than welcome to uh, participate. Um, and it'll be a, a good sort of gentle introduction to the medium for you as well. So uh, that's kind of the gist of it. <laughs> um, and if people have questions about that, of course, I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah, and if I can just add the Chaco Master Copies live class was so awesome. So you guys don't want to miss this one. It was fun. Yeah, we had a good time. <laughs> um, I was so impressed by um, the student work in that in that class. Uh, I mean, people just, um, I, I hope learned a lot, but I mean, they also just made really, really beautiful work. Um, you know, every week I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> these students are amazing. Um, but yeah, New Masters Academy students are always just, I feel so dedicated and so passionate and um, um, and, and are just always so excited to learn. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's fun to, <laughs> to work with as a teacher for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm excited to, uh, to teach the new one as well. I think it's going to be fun. Just very slowly creeping along here. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm definitely not the fastest painter in the world, as some of you might already know. Just a little tiny um, occluded shadow in there between that outside petal. Um, uh, where it kind of meets up with this uh, next inner petal there. Um, it's uh, important to remember with the uh, painting stuff like uh, like flowers, but also it's true with uh, portraits and figures as well, that when you have occluded shadows like that, areas where, you know, the you have little, um, uh, little crevices like that, places where the, the flower is creating a shadow between petals, um, that those are not going to be um, very, very dark. They're going to actually tend to be pretty colorful, um, and therefore they can only be so dark. Um, uh, and you'll notice that also uh, uh, painting portraits as well, um, uh, that you don't tend to have uh, very many like black shadows on the face. You'll tend to see actually um, more saturation in the in the darkest areas of the face where you might have shadows occurring. Let's start to paint this lower petal here, and then uh, I'll jump back to that um, uh, center there. I should also do just a little tiny bit more probably um, in the, um, uh, what do you call it, <laughs> background. Uh, Marjo would like to know, can you possibly hint at what kind of references you've picked for the oil painting <laughs> class? Um, yeah, there'll be definitely some overlap. 
uh, with some of the reference that you guys looked at last time. Um, lately, I'm uh, a little bit obsessed with uh, the work of Thomas Dewing, who um, I think I mentioned yesterday in my Q&A, and I posted a master study that I did of one of his paintings on Instagram today. Um, so I would like to do uh, uh, one of those possibly for a demo, we'll see. Um, I just really like his work. Um, and uh, 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 I, I, I might do, uh, use some references of, um, I can't remember his first name, Thayer. Do you know who I'm talking about, <laughs> Peter? Yes. Uh, I like his work a lot as well. Actually, he made some really beautiful um, landscape paintings too, which I didn't really realize. Um, Croyer, I picked out some Croyer paintings. Um, uh, there's a lot of good stuff, but probably stuff that's not too unfamiliar. Um, it, different stuff than what we did in the, the first class, but um, not unrelated for sure. Um, like we'll still probably look at Edgar Payne in uh, Landscape Week. Um, uh, people like that. So, uh, was that Abbott Henderson Thea? Yes, that one. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, oh, so great. He's so good. Oh my gosh, beautiful. Um, uh, yeah, I love those. Anyway, um, okay, I gotta like really focus here for a second. Okay, I'm background. Let's do a little bit of background. Um, I'll do a because the background here is quite dark. Um, and the thing is, it can be a little bit hard to tell where things are going when you don't have the full value range really established. Um, so I'll just uh, uh, put in a little bit of that so I can start to see where everything is going. It takes a while to uh, get to the point where you can really do that because um, you have to have you know enough of the painting built up that it makes sense to um, do some uh, some some negative painting. Um, around the thing. So but I think I have enough that I can do it. So and I'm using a, um, this is actually a Comer brush. So maybe you can see if I, can you see how it's all like not very, not very even, it has some texture to it. So if you take um, the end of that brush and draw that right along the contour um, of the flower, you get a tiny bit of a soft edge there um, so that you can actually see a bit of texture there instead of it just being sort of a flat, sharp uh, shape. Um, uh, so I, I, I think about that a lot. Where do I want to have a little bit of a softer edge? Where maybe do I even want to take um, another brush and uh, drag some of that background back into the flower. Um, and as I'm doing that, I'm just um, uh, wiping off the excess paint off of the brush so that I don't start to um, add paint too much uh, where I'm not intending to. So it's important to, uh, you know, if you're, if you're doing that kind of thing, taking a brush and dragging it through to soften things or whatever, um, to just be aware of how much how, how much paint basically is on the brush um, so that you're uh, not uh, uh, you know you're not um, just making a mess <laughs> basically mixing on the surface. Where did Peter go? Uh oh Come back. Okay. I don't know where Peter went. I hope he comes back. <laughs> but I can see the chat now. So if you guys have uh, more further questions uh, about anything, please uh, feel free to ask. I'm still here. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, it's above. Could you actually type it in again if you don't mind? So I don't have to scroll back for you. Oh, thank you. One moment. 
still in Save the Day. <laughs> oh, there's Peter. He's back. We lost you for a minute. Um, they ask, right now the petals are simplified, but do you ever find yourself getting lost in the petal or leaf details and then fudging or making things up to make it fit? They tend to get lost and have difficulty finding their way out, if that makes sense. Yeah, like you kind of lose your spot. <laughs> you get lost in like the labyrinth of all the petals going around everywhere. Um, yeah, that that happens. Um, the yes, <laughs> okay, I, I feel you. First of all, um, yeah. So I think one uh, one way to to deal with that. I mean, one thing is uh, you can often sort of do essentially what you're saying, kind of uh, problem solve your way through it. Um, uh, if you if you get a little bit lost and things end up being not quite in the right place, I think always, whatever you're painting, it's important to remember that at some point the reference is going to go away um, and the painting has to stand up on its own. So if, uh, if you're a little bit lost in the pedals and they, um, you know, got mixed up or you, uh, uh, you know, got, uh, kind of mired in all of the detail there and, and, and couldn't find your way out. Um, it, it doesn't actually have to be exact to what you're seeing in the, in the flower, at least in my world, it doesn't. Um, it just has to be believable and hopefully it should be beautiful too, if that's possible. Um, uh, so if you're uh, kind of lost in all the petals, you have those priorities uh, in mind that it should look believable and it should still have kind of a, a quality of design to it, that it should be, um, you know, still uh, uh, beautifully thought through and painted, even if it's not actually that accurate <laughs> to what you were really seeing. And sometimes that that does happen. Um, I think if, uh, if that's a, a really consistent problem, it's uh, probably something to work on with your, your drawing in general. I mean, you guys should always be drawing as much as possible. I think I said yesterday, ABD, always be drawing, right? Um, so spend as much time drawing as you can and, and, and doing that makes your painting better, right? Uh, drawing and, and painting um, uh, is, um, uh, drawing and painting are continuations of the same activity. So if you're working on your, um, uh, if you're working on your uh, drawing really consistently, it will make your painting better. And that will probably help with issues like that of getting um, lost in the petals. And then the other thing as well um, is to always work from your largest forms down slowly, gradually to your smaller forms. So uh, if you're uh, uh, getting lost, it could be because you're looking um, at individual petal shapes and trying to map those in too early, too quickly. Um, uh, and it would probably help to just uh, think through all the larger forms first and uh, slowly, 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 uh, gradually build uh, down to the uh, uh, the smaller ones. Um, and usually the, the drawing gets easier as you go um, because you've already uh, laid a foundation uh, working that way. So then you're less likely to get lost, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. It, I think the question was, does that happen to me? The short answer is yes. <laughs> it does. Um, um, oh, and I just saw someone ask, oh, Peter, are you talking? I can't hear you. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -huh. But I, I saw someone ask if they can use water mixable oils in the class, and uh, yeah, absolutely you can. Um, uh, that is uh, just fine to do. I think in the in the last oil painting class I taught, which was um, studio painting fundamentals, I uh, had a lot of students using um, water mixable oils. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have a lot of familiarity with them myself, so. Um, if you have, uh, you know, technical questions about them, I might not be the biggest help with that. Um, but there's actually a lot of other um, uh, students on in NMA and on Discord that uh, are are uh, much more familiar with them, so they can always, uh, uh, you know, help you out too. 
Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> okay, I'm Great. here. Uh, let's try that again. Can yes, I can me? hear you. Fantastic. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to say before how fantastical of that advice was, Catherine. And, and as we are coming to the end, and it's, it always happens too quickly, I just want to plug uh, a free Friday figure drawing event on our digital campus on Discord. Uh, so in just a moment, hop over to that, and the fun will continue. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that that was happening today. That sounds awesome. Are you telling me that it's time to wrap up? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> In just a few, we, okay. we never want to let you go, Catherine. <laughs> oh. We can keep going for a moment here. Okay. All right. Uh, well, any any last questions, folks, about anything at all, painting or materials or the class or whatever? Yeah, let's go for one last one here. Sure, go Jeremiah. for it. Uh, when the painting is finished do you do a final brush cleaning with terps or oms um yeah that's a good question um no i don't i just use uh i use oil to get all the uh kind of you know big chunks of paint <laughs> out of the out of the brush and then i wash them with soap and water um and so there's really no need to use terp at all in my opinion sometimes you need it for varnishing uh, you need a, a, a strong solvent for to dissolve the resins and varnish, but um, but I just rinse them out in oil and then soap and water. And this is the best soap. So if you were wondering what is the soap to use, it's this stuff, the Chelsea Classical Studio uh, lavender brush soap. It's the best. It truly is. I'm not just saying that. It's the best. <laughs> um, and that gets your brushes really, really, really clean. Um, and kind of keeps them a little bit moisturized too, the same way like you should condition your hair or whatever to keep it from being super dry. Um, same thing if you're just rinsing out your brushes with turp, uh, it's gonna dry them out and uh, uh, make them uh, not so nice and, uh, and misshape them a bit. So uh, use some kind of a soap that's a bit conditioning so that they stay, uh, that they stay nice. Um, that's a good question, thank you for asking that. Well, I might do just, I got farther than I thought I would, Peter. <laughs> Looks amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's very short. But we're not here. surprised about that. Well, <laughs> you, I think you know that I'm not necessarily like quick with this kind of stuff. So an hour for me is pretty, pretty short, but it's also kind of fun. You know, you just get some ideas out really fast and just kind of move along and no big deal. So yeah, nothing wrong with that. Anyway. Okay, fantastic. So Catherine, I just wanna say a huge thank you to you for being here. Uh, you're such an amazing teacher and <laughs> You always spend so much time supporting the students uh, in our community. So just huge thank you to you. Uh, it's always a pleasure to watch you demo live as well. Oh, well, thank you. Um, and I also wanted to say, yeah, no, please. I was just going to say thank you for hosting <laughs> um, and for thank you for helping to make the uh, 10 year anniversary event, you know, happen and special and exciting for the whole community. And of course, also for putting up with me in all of my demos. <laughs> <laughs> Peter deals with me a lot, um, but it's always no, it's, it's my pleasure, Catherine. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> thank you. And I just want to say, of course, um, a big thank you to the whole NMA team for for putting this together, and also thank you to you, all of the students, for making this happen. So um, be sure to stay tuned for all of the exciting events that are coming up in the next few days, and um, make sure to hop over to the the Friday figure drawing. Yes, that sounds uh, okay. really fun. Thanks, everyone. Yes, thank you.